Welcome everyone, this is Coffee with Catholic Workers, a podcast about and with Catholic Worker folks. My name is Theo. I've been a part of the Catholic Worker movement in Los Angeles and around the Midwest since 2010. And I'm Lydia. I've been a Catholic Worker since, uh, I believe, around 2011, 2012, uh, mostly in Chicago, although I am uh, currently partially displaced to Iowa. We realized there was folks interested in the Catholic Worker, and one of the places they couldn't find it yet was in the form of a podcast. So we're happy to be bringing this to folks. We're very excited for our first episode to have Julie Brown, a Des Moines Catholic Worker of more than a decade who also spends time in Kurdistan joining us today. So part of our recruitment of Julie uh, is because she's a a very interesting person and her story is very compelling, um, but also was a choice out of convenience since Julie, Theo, and I also helped moderate a Catholic Worker Facebook group. Catholic Worker Movement, if you want to find us on Facebook. Well, should we get to the interview then? All right, let's do it. Very happy to have Julie Brown with us coming uh, from Kurdistan, but sometimes with the Des Moines Catholic worker. How how have things been with you, Julie? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, Let's see, things are good. Right now it's the evening in Kurdistan. It's very early in the morning for you guys. Um, But yeah, things are good. Um, I've been here for... I've been out of the U.S. now this time for just a couple months, so I was about a month and a half or so. Um, And my husband and I have been working on a little tiny farm that we bought here, so we've been devoting a lot of time to that. And, um, yeah, he's at work right now, so things are good. But when when you're in the U.S., you're hanging out in Des Moines with the Catholic workers there. Can you tell us about the Des Moines worker, what they're about? work they do? Yeah, so the Des Moines worker is what I call my home base. I've been a part of the Des Moines worker for the better part of 10 years. I had like a small um, period where I also joined the Waterloo Catholic worker. So I've been a Catholic worker for over 10 years now. And um, let's see, I do you want to hear about how I joined the Des Moines worker? Maybe that that's a good place to start. Yeah, sure. I, I see your head nod. Okay, so um, um, I don't know, was it 10, 11 years ago? This is also when I met you, uh, Theo. Occupy was happening, and before that, I was just, I don't know, I would guess your average um, U.S. citizen from rural America, um, and I wasn't political at all. I was a single mom. And um, my son went to go live with his dad and and I moved into the city of Des Moines and um, didn't really know anybody. And that's when Occupy was starting. And I just kind of rolled up out of boredom to ask them what they were what they were doing. And and folks started talking about income inequality and all these different things that I'd really never thought about before. Um, And they asked if. I wanted to stay the night and I'm like, well, I'm a camper. I have all my tent stuff in my car. Sure. I'll stay the night. I don't have anything better to do. And that turned into me being part of the Occupy movement and and camping full time uh, behind the Iowa state Capitol through the winter. And that's where I met the Catholic workers. I didn't know they were Catholic workers at the time. I just knew there was some kind of hippie folks that were showing up in the morning and picking up our garbage and, bringing back dishes that were clean for us. Um, And that was also a real pivotal moment in my life because I went to a teach-in and went inside this tent and I went because it was cold out. So there was nothing better to do. So I stumbled in this tent and there's this guy in there talking about Martin Luther King's principles of nonviolence. And um, it's something that I'd heard about before when I was in school, you know, about Martin Luther King, but never really understood what um, his methodology was and reasoning for for the tactics that they were using and the beliefs they had, and how that could 
be applied to, to people's lives today. And like in those few moments, my mind was blown. I don't know, like something just clicked and I'm just like, this is what I need to do. Um, I, you know, I would say looking back, I had a fairly violent background um, in the way that I, you know, some of the people around me and also the way that I interacted with the world. And that seemed like a way that I could gain control of my life if I learned how to practice nonviolence. Um, fast forward a little bit further, and the camp was beginning to close. Things were kind of coming to a to a wrap up with Occupy, and I remember I was just one one day sitting on the porch at my dad's house and just kind of praying. Um, you know, and I'm not an extremely religious person, or wasn't. I wouldn't said I was a religious church going person, but you know those random prayers when you really need something like money for the light bill or whatever. And it was one of those like, Hey God, I haven't talk to you in a while, but I need, I need a favor here. <laughs> what am I, what am I to do when this camp closes? Um, at that point I'd been spending all my time at the camp. And so I'd been part of this community that was something completely new to me. And it was myself and two other folks, um, that had homes and about a dozen unhoused people that had been living with us and they'd become my friends and yeah it was just kind of like what do I do now do I do I go back to bartending like like now what <laughs> um and a couple weeks later uh this guy that had given the 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 talk on nonviolence, I'd learned his name by that time his name was Frank Cordero he came up to me and says you know, you need to be a Catholic worker. And I said, I don't, no, I'm not Catholic. He said, you don't have to be Catholic. I said, well, he's like, just come check us out. I was like, I don't even know what a Catholic worker is. And so he'd said, you know, what you're doing here in the camp with folks, um, we do the same thing, only we don't live in tents. So why don't you come check out our house? So, uh, so I went to the Catholic worker house to volunteer. And when I walked in, it was like all the people who had been spending the night at the camp were there during the day. And I was like, oh, here's my people. Um, and so I started volunteering and that's how I moved in. And um, yeah, so so the Des Moines Catholic Worker um, at that time before COVID um, was mainly a, a drop-in center during the daytime. And they give out toiletries and um, let people take showers and serve a lot of meals let people take groceries. And um, there were a couple things, um, and then I'll wrap this up. There was a couple things in those first days that I was at the Catholic Worker that, besides the fact that I knew a lot of the guests, um, that really um, made me want to be a part of that. And that was one day I was in helping sort clothes and just kind of putting them out. Um, on clothes racks, and I asked one of the Catholic workers at that time, Renee, how do you, um, <clears throat> like, how do you kind of regulate this so that people don't take everything? And she was like, nah, people can just take whatever they want. And, you know, being somebody who, who was on extremely limited budget, raising my son, like, I didn't understand that you could go somewhere and that people would just let you take what you need. And um, and it was the same in, in the storeroom where they were giving out boxes of food or bags of food. I'd ask, well, you know, are there forms to fill out or how do you decide, you know, what's, what's the process like to get food? And they were just like, oh, they just come up and ask for food and we just give it to them. And I was just like, what do you mean? Like, I remember going to the Salvation Army want, needing food and having somebody pick over my, my meager, you know, a few hundred dollars I'd made that month and, and shame me for what I'd spent it on and before giving me a box of food. And so there, it was like this way of interacting with the world was something that I'd never seen before. And I just thought was really precious that I wanted to be a part of. So that's kind of the Des Moines Catholic worker, or how I became a Catholic worker. Yeah. Wow, who would have thought that moving into the Des Moines worker would be an upgrade from, uh, you know, <laughs> sleeping out in tents? Quite yeah, the journey yeah. there. So, so that got you into the Catholic worker, and since then you've also become involved with CPT. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about that and your journey from the worker to CPT and ending up in Kurdistan? Yeah, sure. So when I joined the Des Moines Catholic Worker, I was extremely interested in learning about nonviolence. Like I wanted to go to nonviolence trainings um, and I went to everyone that was that I could find and was traveling around going to nonviolence trainings. And um, then I stumbled into actually a different organization, um, Meta Peace Team um, trainings and our community, several of us from the community did, did like an intense training. I can't remember, maybe it was like a week long. And, um, and during that, they were showing videos of people in Palestine because they also sent teams to Palestine. And um, I remember just watching those videos and just being like, I, I just, first of all, I, I didn't really understand the Israel, um, the Israeli occupation of Palestine. You know, I'd heard about it, but I didn't really understand what that looked like until I saw a lot of videos and, and met a lot of people that were um, directly, you know, working on that social justice issue. And I, I was angry, honestly. And they, they were just like, "Yeah, you could go." And I'd never thought about something like that before. And um, at the time, Jessica Reznicek, um, who's my close friend and now in, in prison for um, sabotaging the Dakota Access Pipeline, the two of us were both at this training. And um, and we decided together that we would like to go to Palestine, but we didn't have the money to go. So we came back to the, to the Catholic worker and kind of told folks, yeah, you know, we think we'd like to go to Palestine. And within just a couple of weeks, somebody donated enough money for us to go, which was a big shock because then I actually had to go. <laughs> and I was really kind of scared. Um, I'd never done anything like that before. I'd never traveled out of the country um, without my family. Um, it Like that kind of thing was just something people in my, in my family just don't do. And so it was that was a big turning point where I just really had to say like, one of two things is going to happen. I have to hold on to my beliefs that everybody from the Middle East is out to harm folks from the U.S., or I have to just turn myself over to the ideas of the folks that I've just met in the last few years who I've really come to trust and love, and that maybe my worldview is not all, you know, encompassing and, and truthful. And so... I had my first trip to Palestine and it rocked my world. I just came back and I was just like, no, everything we've heard is a lie. It was like one of those things. And so then I went another time um, a year later with another Catholic worker friend. And um, on those short trips, I I'd started making some, some like, like started meeting people in the community and realized that if I was going to do this type of international solidarity work, I wanted to be with an organization that really stays in one spot for quite a while. Um, and that's when I met um, community peacemaker teams. They used to be Christian peacemaker teams. They just went through a name change. I met them in Palestine. And so um, in discerning with my Catholic worker community, what it might look like for me to to do more international solidarity work. Um, I decided to join CPT, went through their training, um, and I was made part of the core. And during, or actually before the training, another Catholic worker, Michelle Obed, um, was also a CPTer and talked to me a lot about Iraqi Kurdistan. And so just for some reason, I don't know, grace of God, when I came out of training, I decided to go to Iraqi Kurdistan instead of Palestine. And I wasn't sure why I made that decision, but I did. And it it's changed my life. Now I have a, a husband and stepchildren and a, a whole nother life here in Kurdistan. It's been about seven years now I've been working here. What, what is the situation in Kurdistan? I feel like it's probably less known even than the Palestine situation? And and how does your work interact with that? What does it look like day to day? Yeah, so um, so my work's changed a little bit in the last couple of years because I have a new position with CPT. Um, but I started out for the first several years on a field team here. 
And what that looks like is there's a team on the ground um, made up of folks who are Kurdish from the area and also some internationals um, working together and they focus on a few main projects. Um, one is solidarity with imprisoned journalists and activists. Um, an another one is um, they do nonviolence trainings here. And the one of the of the other large projects is working with um, communities that are impacted by cross-border bombing. So there's a lot of communities along the border. And when I talk about Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, that's like northern Iraq. Um, they have their, here in Kurdistan, it's an autonomous region that has its own government, its own culture, its own language. Um, but along the, the borders with Turkey and the borders of Iran, um, there's a lot of bombing from those countries um, against separatist groups from within like Turkey and Iran. And so CPT, just as an example, what it might look like is if there was a bombing, um, CPT would go and, and visit with those that were directly impacted, the villagers, um, the families, um, get statements, write reports, and then help the family advocate um, on as big a network as possible to end those bombings. So if people are interested in solidarity work, they could go to cpt.org and there's a lot on how to become involved with the ground team here. So I did that for a lot of years. And then recently I've um, taken a position with the administrative team where I just, or not just, but where I do a lot of um, talking about CPT and um, getting people involved with CPT work. So I'm the outreach coordinator and that can be done remotely. So now my work in CPT or my work in Iraqi Kurdistan looks like it's shifting a bit from field work to kind of like an everyday family life in another country in a new context. And so, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a little different now than what it used to be. So that's that's quite the split between uh, continents and roles. What is that like to balance trying to be a part of the Des Moines worker and also have this this entirely separate life? So it's it's difficult. Um, you know that it was it was never the plan. <laughs> the plan was to um, you know, we started a project in Des Moines called the Rachel Corey Project to support people who are interested in international peace work. And the idea of that would be to help um, fundraise, to send people on delegations to different um, different areas of, of their personal interests where there was conflict and um, to plug into um, to organizations like CPT uh, to, to really learn about that context and then to bring their knowledge home and do advocacy. And then the Rachel Corey Project's other um, mission was to support folks who've been doing international advocacy work, maybe have it be a place that they could come to decompress or when they're re-entering the U.S., um, just kind of like a haven, a place to relax where we would take care of all their needs. So that was kind of the idea from the Des Moines Catholic Worker. So me coming to Kurdistan, I met my husband, and that's where the, the shift <laughs> took place, is that it wasn't as easy for me just to go back um, to Des Moines, because then I got fell in love and got married and have a family. So we've been waiting for my husband to, Muhammad is his name, I'm gonna quit calling him my husband all the time. We've been waiting for, for Muhammad to get his green card, and that's been extremely difficult. Um, especially during the Trump administration. There was a Muslim ban put in place that affected people from, uh, with people with Iraqi passports, as well as six other countries, I believe. Um, now the, the, that process is loosened up some. Um, Mohammed just had his green card interview finally after waiting four years. And um, he was denied because they want to do another level of security checks. Um, and that was something that that Trump put in place when he was president that can be used at discretion in s several different countries. Um, and so Mohammed fell under that. So we're just waiting for anywhere from 21 days to eight months to figure out whether he gets to come to the U.S. Um, but ideally, you know, what it will look like in the future is that 
um, Mohammed and I would live together at the Catholic Worker in the U.S. Um, along with his two sons, one who's still in high school, will be graduating in a couple years, and the other who's in college. Um, and then they would be able to travel back here to Kurdistan to see their family and spend time. So that's kind of the long-term goal. But in between, it's really difficult. Um, you know, the, De the Des Moines community is my family. And so they're going, doing their day-to-day -day lives. A lot of changes have been happening. A new family from Columbia has moved into the Des Moines worker. Um, and so I see the little messages, you know, on the, on the, on the chats, but I've never met these folks and, and I hear they're awesome and I'm excited to meet them. But so there's that little thing in the back of my head that that's always, I always feel like I'm missing out on big things when, when they're happening and, and vice versa when I'm in the U S you know, like my, my husband uh, graduated from university and I wasn't able to go to his graduation. So there's a little bit of loss on both sides, but you know, I think about the privilege that I have to be able to travel back and forth. A lot of people don't have the ability to do that, don't have a work that supports that, don't have communities that support that, don't have passports. So um, so when I'm feeling down, I can always think like, you know, I'm, I have a lot of privilege. So shifting back a little bit to, to thinking about the Catholic worker, um, it sounds like one of one of the values that has really impacted your life significantly is this value of nonviolence. Um, what are some of the other things about the Catholic worker, either as a movement or about the Des Moines um, Catholic worker specifically? Um, have you found most value in? So it, it's it's really hard to articulate the all the things that I like about the Catholic worker. Um, first of all, it's it's difficult. <laughs> the Catholic worker is always difficult. There's this challenge, and the challenge isn't always like how to make the meals or, or how to you know um, calm a rowdy guest. Um, it, a lot of times, it's how to live with a lot of other people um, <laughs> that are all trying to figure out what it is to be a Catholic worker, what it is to be a Catholic worker community. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy places where where Catholic worker groups can be together, like Sugar Creek, for example, and, and hearing these common things happening in all the different communities. Um, but I think that that points me back to something that I really like about the Catholic worker, and it's in the aims and the means, that Catholic workers are meant to be centers for learning to do the works of mercy. And I always focus on the learning part. Um, so that is, n none of us really know how to do this or how to do this, you know, perfectly. Some people do it better than others, um, but there, you know, it's it's places for us to learn. So I feel like I'm on a journey along with everybody who lives with me um, or or Catholic workers in general to figure out, you know, how how to be the best people we can in the world, how to build community together, how to, how to be nonviolent. Um, you know, some Catholic worker communities are focused on how to grow your own food, you know, um, and, and there's so many different Catholic workers that are all learning different things together that you can, you know, do like what Theo's doing and go on a big tour and go around and, and, and learn so much from different communities. Um, so I think there's like a humbleness in, in that statement that we're meant to be places to learn. You, um, not, not necessarily learn from always, right? But we're living together while we're learning. So I think that's one. And then I've had a lot of really hard times in my past in my life where I didn't have money, um, you know, where I didn't have a stable place to live and seeing how or remembering how that felt, how I was treated by people, you know, there's a lot of shame in that. And at the Catholic worker, having opportunities to not treat people that same way has been a really valuable thing in my life. And or or seeing somebody and and remembering like I I know exactly what that feels like, um, 
and and I wish somebody would have treated me in this way. And then being able to just do that and not having a manager tell me that I did that incorrectly. You know, just having that freedom to be like, you know, this person got flooded out. I'm going to go buy them a tent. <laughs> Nobody's going to say like, how dare you buy them a tent? We don't buy tents here. You know, it's it's fairly, it, I think it's easy to ask for forgiveness from Catholic workers. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we're not supposed to do, but, but when we do it, you know, especially if it's, if it's helping somebody else out, I think other folks understand that, that that's okay. Yeah. Anyway, I like that about the Catholic group. I could go on. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. Easier sometimes to ask forgiveness, particularly when you're, you're giving items away of, uh, <laughs> where did that house item go? Um, so it seems like you have this personality of when you are convicted of something or become passionate about something, it's easy for you to sort of jump all in. Um, and sometimes it feels like that's a difficult piece for people who are sort of interested about the Catholic worker, but don't know what to do next. Um, and so what, what were some of the things that freed you to feel like you could make these commitments to the Catholic worker or CPT or, or living a radically different life. And do you have any advice for people who are, are interested in the Catholic worker, but aren't sure how to get into it? Yeah. So like I said, I was really going through a transition when I joined the Catholic worker. So I recognized that I had a freedom in my life that a lot of folks don't have. I was working um, as a bartender in the evenings. So I had a lot of day days, free. I also, my son had went to go live with his father, so I didn't have the commitment of taking care of anybody else but myself at the time. Um, and I didn't, you know, I, I came from poverty personally in my life, so I didn't have like loans, I, things like that, that I, that I had to pay for. So, I mean, in, in some ways that was really freeing. So it was easier for me to say, like, yeah, I'm going to go live with these folks and I'm not going to get paid and, and all these things. But, you know, the longer I've been at the Catholic Worker and, and those kind of questions have come up, like how how does somebody who who has a family, you know, move into a Catholic Worker? And I think that's where it really you know, the great thing about the Catholic Workers is they're all different. The Catholic Worker communities are all different. So where one Catholic worker community might be geared towards, you know, folks that are just staying for short amounts of time or younger folks, or, or maybe it's more difficult for children to live in, there's going to be another Catholic worker community that's ready for kids and, and, and or you kind of, it's not, basically what I'm trying to say is there's a Catholic worker out there for everybody. <laughs> it might not be the Catholic worker that's, that's actually in your community. You know, it could be, or maybe you need to start your own, you know, maybe that's, that's the, the idea of the category is go volunteer a few times and see what it's like, see if you like it. And then maybe just start your own Catholic worker. Cause that's how we build a, build a movement. And maybe that looks like you and your, your children and your husband starting a little farm, or maybe it's just you guys living in your home and inviting someone to come and stay with you. That's unhoused. Like, to be a Catholic worker, you just have to say like, hey, we're a Catholic worker. There's not like a, a, a formal process you have to go through. So um, I think the work is really easy to become involved in because all the communities like to have volunteers and like to have conversations, like to have round tables, like to share their thoughts. Um, yeah. So. So I think the first step for um, anybody who's interested in the Catholic worker is to see if there's one near you and just go visit them and see who they are. And maybe, you know, there's a lot of online resources, um, but yeah, I would just go check one out and see if it's for you or not. Yeah, that, that relational thing, you know, was seems like it was big for you finding Des Moines, like you just actually met some Catholic workers. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, I definitely was not looking for um, a faith-based 
anarchist commune type community to live in and work and not get paid. Like that was not on my radar ever. <laughs> I, I didn't understand what any of that even meant. So, um, so yeah, I mean, just becoming involved and getting to know people and just see what actually is happening um, and, and, and realizing I could see myself in that environment and having some really close friends there um, really made it possible for me to move in full time. Life goals you never knew you had. The yeah. Anarchist like Christian commune living with no income. Yeah, no, that was definitely not a goal. But, you know, but there was something that I heard, you know, along the way that was like, you know, I didn't have money moving into the Catholic worker and it was not from for lack of trying. Like I was trying real hard to make it and it just wasn't working. Um, you know, I'd had, I'm, I'm a cancer survivor. I had two bone marrow transplants right out of high school. And that set me up for $250,000 in debt from age 18 and then was a single mom. So this is like, I, I don't think I, you know, realized how far in the hole I was starting. And so when I, when I found the Catholic worker and they were just like, you know, you can paddle your whole life and try to attain these these things, you know, like material things, like, like a new car or a new house or whatever, or you can just like give that all up and just try to be happy. Um, that was something that I was just like, yeah, I was exhausted. I was just so exhausted. And it was like a lifeline that was just, they're just like, here, come live with us. <laughs> yeah. So it was great. Well, there's this interesting piece where a lot of people look at the Catholic worker and view it in that view of like, ah, oh, people have to like give these things up, whether it's like privacy or autonomy of like their own decision making or this piece of, of money in it. I think sometimes people looking into the Catholic worker feel like, wow, like you all are saints for this like huge sacrifices you make. Um, but what I'm hearing from you is that it's different. It, you you gained something by letting go of some of those dreams. Yeah. Um, and, you know, everybody who comes to the Catholic worker comes from a different place. So I do live with people who, you know, who are trying to figure out how do I give away or how do I manage this this money that I have for my family? You know, and so that's something that they're looking at the Catholic worker aims and means and how they want to live in their lives and how, how can they do that with an amount of wealth? And so that's where the ideas of living, a, you know, having a vow of poverty or trying simple living and all of these things, you know, I have a lot of, know a lot of people, there are several in the Des Moines Catholic worker that really find that piece extremely valuable to their life. It's just it, in freeing. Um, when I came into the Catholic worker, it was like, oh, yeah, we're going to pay your bills and we're going to give you Internet and there's a shared vehicle and um, we're going to give you all your food and there's money or there's any money you make from a part time job you get to keep. I was just like, this is an upgrade. <laughs> but um, but I realized I didn't particularly enjoy a lot of the work that I'd been doing for money, the stuff that I really enjoyed was the Catholic worker stuff that wasn't paying me anything. And so I didn't have to go out and get some sort of a job where the manager was a jerk or that was just running me ragged. I could just be at the Catholic worker and be around guests and be around the community. And and the exchange for that was my, my, my room and, and board and also some peace of mind to know that I'm doing some sort of work, but it's not what, you know, the U.S. society would 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 say is gainful employment. And I'm okay with that because it just feels better. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, you know, you're. Sometimes I think about we talk about simple living, thinking it <laughs> at the Catholic worker. You're talking about it being an upgrade, like I. That that's something I've been thinking more about in recent years too. Like, 
I didn't grow up hard or, or anything like that, but like, I don't know, sometimes the food you get at the Catholic worker, I've been at a, one of those Trader Joe's Catholic workers and they're like, we got too much steak. We can't fit any more steak in the fridge. And I'm like, when I, growing up in my house, like we had like food flavored with meat, you know, like spaghetti with meat in the sauce or like rice with chicken in it. And I mean, yeah, that, that, uh, Trader Joe's steak was destined for a dumpster or whatever, but like in a weird way, like, yeah, we're simple living, but for many folks out there, it's not that easy of an equation, you know? Yeah. I don't think I'd ever seen a, a filet mignon. I'd heard of them. I heard their fancy steaks. I'd never seen one until we got like a case of them from Trader Joe's once. And I was like, yeah, we got all these, Filet mignons, like I don't know, it just seemed fancy just to say it, you know. Um, I ruined them all trying to cook them, <laughs> but or any, but yeah, yeah. So, so you never know, you know. We that the Des Moines worker we got Trader Joe's for quite a while. We don't now. We're back to I think Eddie Bloomer would probably call it the same old soup. I think you know, but. Um, Living at the Catholic Worker, you know, it's it's definitely the loaves and fishes thing. It seems like like when you need something, it it will show up. Like, and I think there was this. Speaking of food, there was this one time back when we were getting stuff from Trader Joe's that we got like a case of racks of lamb in, and I'd never had lamb before, and I made enough lamb for 150 people just like you know on the bone learned googled it figured out how to make it and was just like so excited to tell our guests that we were having lamb chops <laughs> um and some people liked it and some people didn't but and i don't know it was probably 700 dollars worth of meat that i made or some ridiculous amount but just like I would have never, ever tried lamb before like that because it's so expensive. I'm sure our guests never would have before. And just to be able to be like, yeah, we're having lamb today. And so it, it, was, it was a really cool experience that we all had together with our guests. Everybody kind of felt fancy that day, I think. <laughs> you know. It is interesting the way that mm, there's this perception essentially of like this idea of like what people should deserve um this idea of like you know people who don't have a lot don't deserve good things um and i i remember distinctly having somebody come who was a friend of a, a guest who was staying with us who walked in the door was like oh this isn't what i expected like this is nice um and essentially believed that like this person because they were didn't have stable housing like deserve to live somewhere like not nice or like a home. Um, and so it's it's really fascinating the ways that we sort of divide up like who gets to eat steak or who gets to eat lamb or the the level of quality of life that we sort of assign as being that's what we expect for people and we're somehow okay with it. And yet here we have the Catholic worker turning that all on its head of you can take whatever you need and, and everybody gets it. I have a lot of things when you, you know, that, that brings up just so many things. Um, I could go on a big tangent about donations, but I'm not going to Maybe <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll tell one very short story. Um, not at the Des Moines workers. I was at a different worker. I don't want to say where it was because I hope the donors doesn't listen to this, but um, <laughs> there is um, this, this, uh, like big uh, company that was having a party and they were excited to to let us know that they were going to be bringing all of their leftovers from this big corporate event and this van pulls up with the uh in the back there was like these containers like these big pans you know and these guys look at it nope not that one look, nope not that one and then gives us these two big pans of ham and we were so excited because we were like, yeah, we're going to make ham. We're going to have ham for our guests. 
And then the van pulls away and we open it up and it was just like the, the crusty wrinkled butts of every ham that they had eaten and the rest of the ham they drove away with. So they gave all the ham butts to this Catholic worker. It, and I was just, it was a running joke there at the worker house for a long time. But it was just kind of that idea of like, who deserves what, right? Like, oh, these folks don't have food, so they're going to appreciate having every little scrap that I don't want. Um, is, is one end of the spectrum, right? And the other end is is that idea of like, I just am able to give more than what I need, and so I'm going to give that to the Catholic worker, or I'm going to give that to somebody on the street. You know, I'm going to expect that they're going to want the same kind of things that I'm going to want. Um, and, and if I have the ability to give that to them or share my own, that I'm going to do that and not give them just the ham butts. So <laughs> anyway. I'm sure you have many, many donation stories. Um, <laughs> I feel like every worker has at some point a really good donation story. Yeah. Um, well, let's say the Catholic worker, we look towards the future and the Catholic worker movement as a whole is wildly successful. Um, we have our moment in history and uh, in trying to go towards uh, the bottom, we somehow create the new viral trend. Um, so what, what does the world look like uh, if the Catholic worker movement becomes wildly successful? Wow. So I mean, that's a hard one because the Catholic worker wants to do so many things, right? So like if we were completely successful, there would be harmony and world peace, right? But on a more like, like bring it down a couple notches. I think success would look, you know, the first step to success would be for folks to be able to have what they need so that they don't have to spend so much time thinking about their day-to-day -day living and could look outward into their community and to other folks and to help other people. So more, you know, like the mutual aid groups that are popping up, like that kind of thing is really important. Um, I think the Catholic worker is, is really close um, to that philosophy and just a lot more of that because you know, people are trying to think about about housing, for example, or trying to, you know, figure out how they're going to work enough hours to, to feed their family. Um, once those basic needs are met, then you have time and energy and mental capacity to think about others and think about peace and, you know, the environment and animal rights and all these other things that, that people care about but just really can't devote much time to. So there's this this larger world change, but also this piece of it starting with personal transformation of being able to get to a spot where people can can actually enact some of those ideals because of the the stability they have with what they need. Yeah, it's, I, th I mean, I think for myself, you know, if I was still trying to work as many minimum wage hours as possible to pay my bills, I would never be able to to be in Kurdistan, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it was that the Catholic worker helped provide that piece that made me stable and gave me the freedom to be able to think about other people in other places besides just myself and my immediate family. Trying to make a world where it's easier to be good, what Peter said, right? That's right. I really appreciate Julia talking to us. It's hard to imagine, you know, if if this thing takes off, having a better guest uh, on future episodes. Thank you so much. There's a lot of awesome Catholic workers out there, yourselves included. You'll have to give your own little story somehow. <laughs> Wow, so that was that was really great to be able to 
speak with Julie and hear her story. I love to hear the the so many ways that people end up coming into the Catholic worker. Yeah, I was kind of thinking during it how, you know, if you're religiously inclined or something, maybe it's like the Holy Spirit or something working when she like randomly uh, shows up in a tent with Frank talking about nonviolence and that being a pivotal moment and and then another one just being like she decides to go to Kurdistan she'd been spending time in Palestine and she she said she didn't really uh know why she made that decision but it obviously worked out as a husband and a couple kids now out there I would guess I was, that that most Catholic workers and houses have these moments in time that they can point to where there are these sort of providential occurrences of things. I know for our house, there's a couple partnerships that that have evolved that we can sort of point to these sort of coincidental moments when you run into people um, sort of by accident or because someone else essentially made a mistake and you can look back and be like, wow, that was this pivotal time. Yeah, well, and I, and I think too, uh, the Des Moines Catholic workers involvement in Occupy is, telling that they were able to get Julie and Jess and, and other folks uh, because they were involved in this kind of people's movement that existed outside of the worker and find folks who are interested in doing similar work as well. You think that sometimes the struggle it feels like internally with the worker figuring out how we have these values that seem like they should resonate with many other people, especially in like this um, political economic uh, moment where a lot of people are dissatisfied with the current system and figuring out those ways of how, how do we create this overlap or this movement that has existed for years into the current moment? Yeah, and I, I think we're better or worse at it from time to time too. Uh, and every Catholic worker is gonna be different. Um, but yeah, I, th I think sometimes we get bogged down in our own Catholic worker worlds and uh, are not open to these, the spirit or whatever coming from these other places. I think one of the things I'm sort of struck by with Julie's story is also, um, just the openness and willingness to go, which I know she talked about having some some freedom from things like financial constraints that not other other people might not have in terms of um, debt or uh, at that moment not having the same obligations for for caring um, in that moment uh, for kids. Uh, but there's also something I think that that's like so close to the movement with this idea of like when you know something that is right to do of somehow finding a way to do it, um, whether in, in sort of this jumping all in way or or in the little ways of personalism. Yeah, and we can all find our ways of doing these things wherever we are. Um, living in community at the Catholic Worker, sometimes it's like, just really a pain in the ass or whatever. But at the same time, uh, it does have that freedom in certain ways. Like Julie could just be like, hey, people I work with, I want to go spend time in Palestine. I want to go spend time in Kurdistan. And, you know, we're each other's bosses and dedicated to that work. And, and you're free to do it um, in many instances. That was for a while during the pandemic, I was kind of working a normal job and it was like, oh, there's some really cool uh, protests against line three up in Minnesota. I wish I could go do that. But it's like, oh, no, I have a normal job. I can't just leave and go protest whatever I want. Yeah. Yeah. Jobs will hold you down. <laughs> Well, I really enjoyed our our inaugural interview with Julie. Looking forward to our future 
um, interviewees, I suppose. Um, so we, we want to thank Julie for participating and being willing to talk with us. Uh, we also want to give a shout out to Chris from the Bloomington uh, Worker for helping us in our editing of the podcast. Uh, and thank you, the listeners, um, for putting up with us uh, for our first podcast. Hopefully this does not scare you away and you come back to hear uh, stories from additional workers. Till next time.